JoJo's Bizarre Adventure Heritage for the Future is one of my favorite fighting games of all time. It's got great movement, a large variety of different and fun characters, and it's an excellent and lovingly crafted tribute to the manga it's based on. However, it's also well known for being an utter mess. It's full of infinite, broken mechanics, and it's not exactly a paragon of balance. Now obviously it's a polished game, but once you start deep diving into it, there's some stupid shit to be found. The roster consists of many unique and fun characters, but concentrated at the top of the tier list are some of the most degenerate characters Capcom has ever designed and added to any of their so-called quality fighting games. The best characters in JoJo are defined by their amazing buttons and tons of ridiculous shit that'll make you never want to play this game again. In this video, I'm going to be discussing the top tiers of JoJo Heritage for the Future, and how they make you regret installing Fightcade. And of course, there's no better way to start than at the top. Kakyoin is the undisputed king of Heritage for the Future, and honestly, it would be easier to list off all the ways that he isn't busted. I already discussed this character in my previous video on fighting game top tiers, and I listed most of his strengths, but a refresher ain't a bad idea, I suppose. When you look at Heritage systems and mechanics, it's clear that Kakyoin plays this game extraordinarily well. Activating his stand, Hierophant Green, gives Kak access to some of the best normals in the game, extended limbs that would make Dalsim blush, and disjoints that make his pokes and anti-airs absurdly good. Kakyoin is an active stand character, meaning he can activate his stand at will to augment his moveset and his mobility. With Hierophant Green out, Kak has unlimited air dashes allowing him to enforce incredible pressure and 50-50 high-low mix-ups or escape bad situations. Of course, it's not any of these that push him over the edge, it's his nets. Hierophant's field is the single best move in the game. Kakyoin can lay down three of these babies and they stun the opponent on hit, allowing for follow-ups. Combined with Kak's high damage and TOD potential thanks to tandem combos, landing a net can often be fatal, and the sheer difficulty that many members of the cast have dealing with them solidifies Kak's strength. It's such that many passive stand characters are considered inherently weaker, because they have no way of dealing with Kak's nets. They also serve as an excellent defensive tool, allowing him to keep his opponents off of him and deal a devastating punish if he manages to ensnare anyone in the net. To seal in how utterly insane this character is, he possesses no losing matchups. No matter who you're fighting, everyone on the roster fears these nets. Kak is oppressive, and the sheer presence of a net on screen can make him unapproachable by about half the fucking roster. Literally his only real weakness, outside of, you know, tournament ban, is a slow wake up timing, which does leave him liable to getting bullied by properly timed OP, but man, this character is ridiculous. And since I already talked about him, I really don't have much to say. Hmm. Oh, I know. Since I sort of skimmed over him last time, let's discuss new Kakyoin, the other Kak on the roster. Trading some moves for new properties and a swaggy pair of shades, new Kak is considered to be substantially weaker than his original variant, but he's still a top 5 character when considering the Kakyoin and Pet Shop bands, so he's obviously still very, very strong. The biggest losses that cause him to be worse than the original are significantly worse nets and weaker properties on many of his special moves. On the other hand, he gains a tricky new tool in the form of his stand on dash, which travels upward at a 45 degree angle a la Morrigan from Darkstalkers, giving him tricky high low mix ups. In addition, he also picks picks up a neat full screen super, and even though his specials are slightly worse, he maintains Kakyoin's incredibly powerful normals, mobility, and still has solid damage. New Kak is also much cooler, so of course he's the superior option in every regard besides viability. Kakyoin as a whole though, is just ridiculous, but if you watched my previous top tiers video, you'd already know. So let's move on to his ridiculous colleague and fellow S plus tier character. Pet Shop. This character is infamous. Flat out infamous. If you ask someone who was familiar with and followed the FGC but never played Heritage for the Future what they knew about it, there's a 98% chance that they'd tell you the same information. That Pet Shop is broken and he's banned. For many years, he was seen as the absolute undisputed number one, although in recent years, people have become more aware of Kakyoin and how his strengths trump the bird. But make no mistake, his fall from first to second doesn't mean he's gotten weaker. He's still an absolutely powerful character who earns his tournament ban with his incredible mobility, his insane damage, and of course, his unblockables. Let's start from the basics though. Pet Shop is, of course, a bird. This means his movement is quite unique amongst the roster and he's equipped with a fast dash and an 8-way air dash. 
The fact that Pet Shop flies means he can straight up hover over numerous low attacks, watching them harmlessly pass over you as you rush their asses down. This allows Pet Shop to render a lot of characters' conventional pressure or pokes entirely obsolete, and gives him dominating matchups against many low tiers, and even a few mid and high tiers like Devo and Iggy, solid characters who just really can't do anything against Pet Shop because of his peculiar flight stance. Of course, this isn't what makes Pet Shop busted or ban worthy. Come on, the minutia of this character's power is so much more than just being immune to lows. First off, Pet Shop is interesting in that he's the only top tier to be a passive stand character. Contrasting active stands like Kakyoin, Jotaro, and Vanilla Ice, who can press the S button to bring out their stand and modify their moveset with a large amount of benefits, passive stand characters don't get any of that. Passive stands don't get any of that. Rather, pressing the S button will launch an attack that differs between characters. Petchop himself can use the S button to fire icicles that aren't really that powerful, but do build good meter. It's worth mentioning that while being a passive stand character is usually seen as a weakness in of itself, Petchop is the only top tier who is a passive stand and the only character to really not be held back by the detriments of a passive stand. And being as strong as he is, it allows him to have access to all of his good tools at any point while also not being vulnerable to stand crashing, something that occasionally can and does fuck over active stand characters. Pet Shop's strengths primarily come from his mix-ups and combo damage, and that all gets tied together by one move, his overhead icicles. Pet Shop can create these things at three different positions on screen, and as I mentioned, they hit his overheads. By hitting with a low at the same time the icicle hits, Pet Shop can unblockable the opponent, leaving them unable to defend. Now it should be made clear that unblockable setups are not rare amongst the roster. In fact, Pet Shop isn't even the only top tier with unblockables, but here's the difference and what makes Pet Shop so insane. Pet Shop's icicle input is to simply hold any of the three attack buttons for about a second. He can do this without even having to stop moving and release them at any time. Whereas characters like Vanilla Ice must commit to their unblockables and perform them on knockdown, Pet Shop can turn any point of the screen into a danger zone, where staying there for even a second can result in getting hit and caught in a TOD. That's what makes this so ridiculous. Oh, yeah, I didn't mention that? With his long combos, insanely powerful and comboable hit grab, and devastating supers that he always has access to because he builds so much fucking meter, if Pet Shop catches you, it's usually fatal. What makes this even crazier is that Pet Shop can create icicles while blocking. Oh, you happen to hit him with a move that's minus on block? Watch as Pet Shop releases his icicle and kills you for your troubles. Given the opportunity to begin his offense, Pet Shop is fucking devastating. His looping unblockables and massive damage are the cherry on top of a character that's already hard enough to catch, and allows him to completely control the pace of a match and enforce his brutal playstyle from almost any position on the screen. The only real flaws that Pet Shop has is low vitality, which isn't helped by the fact that he's missing some defensive mechanics, including the fact that he can't block in midair. It should also be noted that the other top tiers in the game aren't totally shut down by him. Jotaro, Polnareff, Vanilla Ice, and even Abdal have the tools to shut down his approach and hit him out of the air. He's also not the easiest character to learn. He's one of the most unique characters in the game, but you can't just pick him up after learning, say, Jotaro or any other run-of-the-mill active stand character. There's no way to sugarcoat this character's mountain of strengths, though. Pet Shop is an efficient and merciless killer who will leave anyone that dares to challenge him as a bloody and icy mess. The last line in Dio's defense. Vanilla Ice is universally considered to be the best tournament legal character in the game and one of the strongest characters in the roster. He's also a good deal more simple than Tack or Pet Shop, especially in regards to his laundry list of individual strengths. Ice has one of the most unique active stands in the game, because Cream doesn't just appear alongside him when he activates. Rather, Cream eats him and they sort of become one entity, with unique and floaty movement and some seriously good normals. Although he can't perform it an infinite amount of times like Kakyoin, Ice in Stand On Mode does have an air dash that is very fast and allows him to perform instant air dashes for good mix-ups or to retreat from bad positions. With his Stand On 2B and 2C, Ice can poke the hell out of you and build tons of meter while doing it, something that becomes very pertinent once you realize how much damage this character shits out. With these amazing normals, Ice can keep most of the roster out, and the few characters that actually can get in have to contend with Ice's incredible damage and Oki. Ice possesses the tandem super just like every other active stand, and these tandems give him TOD potential if you have the fucking crackhead fingers to mash out ABC 80 times in about 1.5 seconds. But even without TODs, Ice's tandems give him an opportunity to knock the opponent down, and this? 
This is where Vanilla Ice becomes truly terrifying. Now to his credit, Ice has his fair share of not so great gimmicky specials, like Dark Space, which can occasionally let him do some ambiguous cross-ups, but is mostly not that great. He's also got a Flash Kick exclusive to stand on, which is completely and utterly worthless. The reason why I'm not harping on this is because all of this is juxtaposed by the amazing utility that Ice gets from just one move. Yeah, it's just called Cream with an exclamation point. This move sends Cream out and it hits overhead. It also allows Ice to act while Cream is performing the move. This means he can attack at the same time while Cream is being performed. This means that he can hit the opponent with a low at the same time as Cream hitting. This means he can perform unblockables. Wait, he can unblockable and he isn't banned? Maybe the heritage scene just hates birds? Nah, of course Vanilla Ice unblockables aren't nearly as spammable or safe or dumb as pet shops, but still. Even without the unblockables, Ice can still create disgustingly ambiguous mix-ups, leaving the opponent with no choice but to guess which direction to block. And if they guess wrong, well that usually means they're succumbed to the void. What makes Ice particularly scary is the fact that he's a menace at any point on screen. If he isn't in your face unblockable in you and hitting you with 50% tandem combos, he's half a screen away, throwing out his massive normals and making himself nigh impossible to approach, while using his fast dashing speed and rolls to avoid getting locked down. The scariest thing about Ice besides his Oki is his ability to switch on the fly between playstyles, giving him near unmatched versatility. He has the tools to handle any situation that a character might put him in, and switching on the fly is as easy as flowcharting his ridiculous offense. This shit is all half evident even at the lowest level, because realistically, beating a new player with vanilla ice is as simple as using dark space and watching them panic as they get hit by dozens of cross-ups or fake cross-ups. About the only thing Ice suffers from, ignoring some shitty specials and supers, is a low stand gauge, leaving him susceptible to getting stand crashed. Vanilla Ice, just like in the manga, is a deadly and brutal force who can erase health bars as easily as he erases space. He's relatively easy to pick up, and the return for taking the time to learn him between his incredible offense and solid defense is massive. Pick this character if you don't want anyone you played to have fun. Hailing straight from the French motherlands, Ponoraf uses his speedy slashing stand Silver Chariot and his headstrong attitude to become one of the most relentless rushdown characters in the game. Ponoraf is the only top tier to be a charge character, a decision I can only assume was influenced by the fact that Ponoraf's hair happened to inspire the hairstyle of Guile, the first charge character Capcom ever made. This of course means that rather than using standard motion inputs, Ponoraf players must hold back or down to utilize his special moves. Polnareff's kit comes equipped with many tools, but his game plan is primarily centered around one, Shooting Star, which is one of the scariest tools in the entire game. It's his upcharge move, but this ain't no flash kick. Rather, he sends Silver Chariot to the wall, and when the button is released, Chariot will home in on the opponent with his rapier in hand, delivering a swift strike to the head. What makes Shooting Star so powerful is that it's an overhead, and since Polnareff can act almost immediately after sending Chariot out, this means he can use it for some incredibly ambiguous 50-50 mix-ups thanks to his incredibly strong and fast lows. What makes it completely bullshit is that in addition to that fact, the move hits from anywhere on screen, giving Polnareff dominating screen presence and allowing him to start his combos or pressure from anywhere regardless of position. This is a seriously powerful special move, but be wary of the fact that Polnareff cannot block while Shooting Star is in use. Polnareff in general is an incredibly offensive character. Unlike Vanilla Ice or Kakuin who can play a bit safer with good turtling, Polnareff always wants to be in his opponent's face, mixing their shit with Shooting Star. Polnareff is rather unique compared to other top tiers, because while characters like Ice are renowned for their incredibly strong Oki and wake-up pressure, Polnareff's Oki is… not good. In fact, it's pretty bad. Cold's best way of netting knockdowns is his armored takeoff super, but even then, he really doesn't get much off of this, and most of his other moves at knockdown just don't give him much opportunity to do much while his opponent is waking up. Because of this, Polnareff gets much more off of combo resets, which is the act of intentionally ending a combo early and starting a new one, something Polnareff can do quite easily since Shooting Star can be held and released whenever the opponent chooses. Once this character has you in a combo, you have to constantly monitor your character and make sure Polnareff isn't trying to sneak in another Shooting Star mix-up, otherwise you'll quickly find yourself losing health. This character's mix-up potential in standoff is seriously gross. Be aware that stand on Shooting Star is terrible since Polnareff moves along with Chariot, so it just simply doesn't do anything. Speaking of stand on though, Polnareff's stand on is where the character's defensive utility comes in. He trades the insane mix-ups and damage earned from stand off Shooting Star and his fast normals for some of the best pokes and anti-airs in the game. They're fast, disjointed as fuck, 
and the low commitment means he can usually get away with them, even if he misses his anti-airs. In particular, Stand on 4B is one of the best moves in the game for shutting down jumps. No matter what character is attempting to move in from the air, 4B will smack them away and deliver a solid chunk of damage in the meanwhile. You switch to standoff when your opponent begins trying to play as aggressively as you are. Once they start trying to match your aggression, Silver Chariot's excellent normals will check them for any reckless movement, leaving them scared and frustrated and straight up keeping numerous characters from getting in. But once you're ready to go in and go ham, Shooting Star mix-ups will leave your opponent guessing and fearing for their lives. He has a solid projectile super that can help him get in or punish certain attacks from full screen if you don't have Shooting Star charged, so he really is a menace from anywhere on screen. His main issue, aside from Shooting Star not allowing Polnareff up to block while in use, are certain small problems that his moveset has that can sometimes hold you back from completely tearing things up. Heritage for the Future has an infinite prevention system, IPS for short, which will break certain combos once they get too long, and its biggest victim is Polnareff. His many combo extensions and loops can very easily break even if you have a reset planned, so be careful. One of his specials is called Million Splits, and it's a mash move a la Honda Hands or Blanca Electricity. It sucks dick. Don't use it, except you will use it because it's a mash move, which means too many inputs at the same time will activate it against your will. Finally, he has some pretty miserable matchups with the three characters above him on the tier list. Kakuin and Pet Shop in particular just shit on him quite hard, Kak through his defensive play being a little too strong for Paul's hyper-focused rushdown to conquer, and Pet Shop being straight up immune to a lot of shooting star shenanigans. Still, he earns his place as the second best legal character. Remain steadfast and relentless in your rushdown, and Polnareff will easily turn your opponent into a pincushion. The main character of the entire story, Jotaro Kujo, rounds out the top 5 and legal top 3, and even though he's slightly outclassed by his fellow top tiers, he's still immensely powerful. Jotaro is a simple and effective rushdown character whose game plan is focused on getting in his opponent's face and using his high damage combos and deadly oki to end rounds quickly, while utilizing Star Platinum's fast normals and incredibly strong Star Breaker super to maintain defensive stability. Whether with or without his stand, Jotaro's normals are fast, real fast. He's got excellent jabs, great anti-airs, and his stand on 5A is a 2 frame startup punch with high reward on hit and excellent range. Anytime Jotaro is near you, you're in danger of getting hit, and Jotaro can make hits count with high combo damage. Even the most basic Jotaro confirms can bring you alarmingly closer to death, and he's got loads of extensions and tandem setups to bring his damage to another level. He's also a god of stand crashing, so even blocking a hit from him with your stand on can be dangerous and lead to his incredible damage. What really brings this to another level of insanity is that practically any Jotaro combo that doesn't kill will lead to an easy knockdown, upon which Jotaro can really begin to show why he's so dominant. Starfinger is done via a DP input, but this ain't no reversal. Rather, it's an insane Oki tool that gives Jotaro volatile 50-50s and shapes the entire foundation of why Jotaro is so good. The crux of Jotaro's strength is focused in the ridiculous mix-ups Jotaro has. Since he has a fast low in his standoff 6B and an easy instant overhead, this of course forces the opponent to guess between blocking high or low, and if they guess wrong, well they're dead. With just one hit, Jotaro can instantly swing matches in his favor, and his 50-50 mix-ups bring his Oki to another level. Essentially, he's a more rushdown-focused version of Vanilla Ice, only without the unblockables, but he also has a particularly unique super that makes him scary even when he's not fingering you. Star Breaker is potentially one of the most terrifying supers in the game, and let's run down the fucking list. First of all, it does major damage. Getting hit by this thing will chop a significant amount of health off. It also has massive range and it's smothered in invincibility on startup, especially the stand-on version, making it one of the best whiff punishes in the game. Any move, any action that your opponent performs is liable to being punished with this super, and considering Jotaro can build meter quickly and efficiently, you are at constant danger of getting hit by this super when Jotaro is nearby. For the final cherry on top, this move is, for whatever reason, cancelable. Pressing S while Star Platinum is charging will allow Jotaro to faint the super, which allows him to call out attempts to roll through the super or use it as another mix-up, giving him an opportunity for a free throw or whatever the fuck he wants. This is a seriously powerful super. Jotaro isn't without his flaws and he has a particularly big one, which is, well, he's a bit stubby. 
He may be a 6'5 mountain of a man, but his normal short range means he could definitely be outpoked by characters with more powerful normals. This can leave him at a serious disadvantage against characters like Polnareff, but thankfully his normals are also fast, so it's not a complete game ender. It just means you have to play patiently to get in, so make every move count. Don't be reckless, think smart, and think hard. Until you're actually in the opponent's face, that is. Then you can start rolling your face on the controller. Oh yeah, and this is obviously not really relevant to the character's viability, but he also has the time stop super. It's not very good due to the incredibly long startup, but holy shit is it stylish. Incidentally, he also gets arguably the least reward off of it out of all the three characters that can actually perform it, but it's still sick. Use this to disrespect your opponents, or just plain BM. Muhammad Abdul is an interesting character. He's considered by most to be incredibly strong, with most tier lists placing him just outside the top 5 when considering the whole roster, even the banned bird and cherry boy. But he is pretty definitively outclassed by the characters ranked above him. He earns his place though, as arguably the best character in the game that isn't completely broken. Abdul is all about controlling neutral with his excellent buttons. He's often considered to be the closest thing Heritage for the Future has to a Shoto. With a fireball and DP, he does somewhat fit the mold, but he obviously isn't just any run-of-the-mill Ryu duplicate. Abdul's DP is unique in that it only acts as a DP in stand-on mode. Without Magician's Red already in play, Abdul's DP is simply going to send him out, which is a pretty decent combo ender. In stand-on, it's a proper DP, with good damage and vertical range, and it's deceptively hard to punish. He's also got a Fireball, or Fire Onk I suppose, which is a very solid projectile that gives him decent zoning capabilities. The most important specials in Abdul's kit though are the Fire Sensor and the Hit Grab. Fire Sensor sends out a small fire bomb that follows the opponent. By holding down the button used to send it out, Abdul can delay the detonation, which allows him to dictate the pace of a match, since the explosion lets him start combos. It forces the opponent to respect it, so keep this move in mind. It may be easier to ignore among Abdul's more simple or flashy tools, but this sensor is seriously powerful for dominating neutral and making overly reckless opponents reconsider their approach. The hit grab is Abdul's best combo ender and Oki setup tool, since it easily combos out of Abdul's best confirms and knockdowns on hit. It's a hit grab, meaning that although it acts like a throw on hit, it can be blocked. This isn't really relevant to the move as a whole, but it's worth noting that it is plus on block, meaning he can potentially continue his pressure even if the move doesn't hit. Abdul's normals are good. Really good. He's equipped with fast and abusable pokes and strong anti-airs. Combined with a decent projectile, Abdul's game plan is to create a safe and impenetrable wall. Facing a patient Abdul, especially one with the life lead, can be an immensely painful experience because Abdul's kit is built entirely around strong defensive play. However, when put on the offensive, Abdul's strong tandem damage and good supers can allow him to cash out the meter he builds for good damage. Napalm Bomb and Crossfire Hurricane Special both act as excellent reversals. They both enable 50-50s on block, and Napalm Bomb is coated in invincibility on startup. Abdul's most standout super, however, is the Red Onk Trap. This super plants a trap in the ground which detonates. Similar to the fire sensor, Abdul can delay the explosion by holding down the button used to launch the super, but what's really crazy is that the super does not consume meter until Abdul actually releases the Onk. Now getting hit will cancel out the super, but aside from taking damage, there's no detriment because you didn't spend any meter since the Onk wasn't released. This super makes for an excellent reversal and a way for Abdul to control the screen and deter his opponent's offensive actions, so use it well. It goes without saying, Abdul's kit is full of powerful and versatile options, but he ultimately has some key flaws that keep him out of the top 5. His Oki, while strong, isn't as powerful as it could be because his mix-ups are quite limited compared to the other top tiers. In fact, that's pretty much how you could summarize Abdul's flaws as a whole. Even though he's very strong, he's just not that broken. Nothing in his kit quite matches up to Kakyoin's nets, or Pet Shop and Vanilla Ice's unblockables, or Polnareff's resets and shooting star pressure, or Jotaro's 50-50s. Abdul simply doesn't have dark enough dirt, but it's worth mentioning that even though he isn't quite as insane as those characters, he can fight them reasonably well, unlike many mid and low tiers who just get invalidated by those top tiers. He may be outclassed, but he isn't rendered totally obsolete. The most important part of playing Abdul is to maintain your patience. Life leads are very important for Abdul, so should your opponent take it back, do not panic. Look for openings in their offense, and if they're playing defensively, make use of fire sensors and DPs, as well as Abdul's strong pokes, to try and chip them away. Don't lose your head, and more importantly, don't lose your arms.
cap off this video, I wanted to talk about Dio. Now Dio is usually considered just outside of the realm of top tier. Even with the Kakyoin and Pet Shop bands considered, he either falls just outside of the top 5 or is at the tail end depending on who you ask, and he's got some particular issues that can cause him to fall flat. However, he's also incredibly fun and one of the coolest characters on the roster, and he's definitely very strong. So fuck it, let's just throw him into the mix. Dio is a fast and mobile rushdown character with a uh, high skill ceiling to say the least. Dio is almost universally considered to be among the hardest characters in the game to play. In a roster where even the easy and average characters still have tight links and hard combos, Dio absolutely sets a new standard for combo difficulty, and only Devo can really rival him for execution requirements, although that character is a whole different can of worms. Dio is often compared to Jotaro, same type of stand after all, but he has a few properties that set him apart, the most notable of which is his mobility. Dio has a very fast forward and back dash, and his teleports allow him to be unpredictable when making his moves. He's got some very, very fast normals and a full screen laser that can harass opponents from far away. Once Dio gets in is where things get really insane though, as he has a long list of stylish and damaging combos at his disposal. These require constant use of dash and walk cancels, buffering, negative edge, and his combos are flooded with tight one frame links. If you didn't understand what the fuck any of that means, well, it means his combos are hard. Really hard. So hard that it means that not having a good grasp on even the most basic Dio combos can mean you're missing out on lots of damage. The most foundational of these is the Dio Infinite, named the Soul Loop after the player who popularized it. It goes as such, 2A, 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 214A, 661A, 2A, 2A, 214A. Sounds simple, until you realize 2A, 214A is a one-frame link, and the entire loop requires fast fingers to not drop the constant negative edge and looping rhythm that's required. On the upside, it's also immune to the IPS, so that's nice, and learning the basic 2A, 2A, 214A link opens up tons of more advanced tandem combos and stylish loops. If you're an execution monster, you can truly open up the wide potential of this character and his incredible damage. Unfortunately, if you can't, then Dio just doesn't become as strong. Not being able to capitalize off of his fast 2A and his dashes in neutral just doesn't make him as powerful. Dio's kit is full of unorthodox tricks and not so great tools, and he's weighed down by a selection of supers that's kind of bad. With his standoff, Dio has the Road Roller super, and even though it's really cool and fun to watch, it sucks. You might be able to use it as a stylish punish for some other supers, but most of the time, it's going to get blocked because it takes 5 centuries to start up, and then you're losing half your health to a combo. Knives is one of the most polarizing supers in his kit. With his standoff, it sucks. It takes 10 years to start up and it's got almost no invincibility. By the time it starts up, your opponent has already begun blocking it or just straight up punished it. With Stand On, it becomes one of the best supers in the game. It's honestly insane. Not only is it blindingly fast to start up, it's got tons of invincibility, combos into itself for great damage, and it punishes many moves very well. It can also be used in the air, which can shut down a lot of stuff too. Bloody Summoning is okay, but you're better off saving your meter for tandems and knives. Dio's most infamous move, however, is Stand On 623X. This move sends the world out to perform a tracking punch. Just watching this move in action, it might not seem that bad. So allow me to list off why it's the single worst move in the game. First off, the move's tracking only goes as far as the opponent's position when it was activated, and it's so goddamn slow and telegraphed that dodging it on reaction is easy. Real easy. On hit, the move does shit for damage, and the slow startup means you're usually already getting hit by a punish. Also, since Dio is separated from the world while performing this move, hitting Dio while it's out will do extra damage. This move sucks. It'll only get you killed, so avoid it at all costs. Also, his throw is punishable on hit, which eliminates the universal answer against rolls. Provided you're playing against someone who knows how to actually punish it, successfully landing Dio's throw is literally detrimental to Dio himself. It's really dumb. Finally, his mix-up and pressure aren't great, and can be quite predictable. Even though he gets so much reward off of hits, actually landing them can sometimes be the biggest obstacle for Dio, and considering he can't punish characters for rolling away from his pressure without getting killed, well that only complicates things even more. Dio has to play risky and unpredictable to land hits, but once he's in, he truly becomes unstoppable. So that was the top tiers of JoJo Heritage for the Future. I hope you enjoyed this dive into some of fighting games most fucked up and powerful top tiers. This was quite a fun video to make and I enjoyed making it a lot. Huge thanks to the Heritage for the Future community for all the amazing resources available on the internet to make learning this game and researching it just a little easier. 
I'll leave links to the profiles of all the players whose replays were used, because fuck if I'm gonna learn half the shit that makes these characters so good in a timely manner. If you enjoyed this video and you'd like to see more fighting game topics covered, then leave a like and comment as it really helps the channel. Subscribe and hit the notification bell if you want to keep up with my content. Thanks for watching, have a good night, take care.